just for the people at home or wherever you're listening from when you're um, watching online, uh, the question that's going out is, how well does cannabis manage your symptoms? Is it A, cannabis successfully manages my symptoms, B, cannabis somewhat manages my symptoms, or C, cannabis makes no difference to my symptoms? I had put a lot of creative energy into that question. Okay. <laughs> All righty, so we've got um, five panelists, um, many who are first-time speakers in a panel, so I want you all to be supportive. And, um, and so we've got uh, Claire um, Boalich, is that okay? Bevalich, sorry. Um, uh, Julie Durrans, uh, Jerry Roth, uh, Mohammed Wazwe, and Jane Hinchliffe. Um, and just to start, I'd love to hear from all of you, um, one at a time, obviously, rather than all speaking at once. Um, just your own story about, you know, your own experience, your journey to cannabis, your, the condition that you're treating cannabis, um, um, you're using cannabis to treat, um, and a little bit about your, uh, if you have come from the legacy market, how has that transition been? Okay, so go ahead, Claire. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Bevalitz, and I am a chronic pain patient, I guess. So... From the age of 13, I had a horse riding accident which caused chronic pain in my hip ever since. Um, all I can really remember from my teenage years is operations, invasive tests, lots of times looking for an answer. And it wasn't until I was 17 I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. They had finally found a name for my condition so they could start treating me. And this was the point where I was started on gabapentin, duloxetine, opiates, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, lidocaine patches, the little chili powders they can put on you as well. And in twin, when I was 23, I was then also diagnosed with endometriosis. And at this point, I was on over 480 tablets a month. Um, I was on cocodamol, duloxetine, baclofen, omeprazole, sumatriptyline, so many medications that couldn't count. Um, so back in 2015, when I received the endometriosis diagnosis, to me, I was at the point where I was medicating so much just to take four hours to get ready for a three-hour job that I couldn't often complete and then to lie in bed for the rest of the time. So for me to turn to medical cannabis back in 2015, I was at the point where I didn't see any sense of going forward because I was told I couldn't have children and to me that was the final thing that I might have been able to have done. Since 2015, um, I came off all that medication. I was only on 3,500 milligrams cocodamol until 2021 in January, I was able to secure a legal prescription which meant that I knew my supply and access to cannabis medication was secure. I didn't have to worry about car parks or alleys or dealers not showing up last minute. And I've officially been free from opiates over a decade of use since 2021. So um, I first started um, consuming cannabis when I was 16 in what I thought then was a recreational sense. Um, I stopped when I was in my 20s and had children. Stigma got to me. About 10 years ago, when I hit menopause, I became very unwell. Um, I later was diagnosed with Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, fibromyalgia, a host of other comorbidities. Um, I've now got os severe osteoarthritis. Um, and in the past year, found out ADHD and autism also are in the mix, which is why when I was 16 and consumed cannabis, it made me able to function. <laughs> and it was, and now recognize that I did benefit from it, even though I thought it was recreational. So when I came back to it, I'd, I was an occasional, I'd go to my friend's house and I'd have a cheeky little joint there. And I started to recognize that I felt better like you, I was on the, pretty much the same medication. It was handfuls at a time. I lost my business. Um, I had a travel agency for 15 years, my own business. I was successful. Gabapentin made me start booking people on the wrong flights on the wrong day. Um, I had to sell up and I, I quit work about seven years ago um, and moved to Milton Keynes from York. 
Um, what I did there was I met people running Milton Keynes Cannabis Club because I, I didn't know where to get cannabis from. I was still legacy market. And through the people I met through the club system, the club, I mean, there's a club network all across the country. It's not as active as it once was. Um, but Milton Keynes, we still have a monthly meet. Um, we had one last night and we have a mixture of medical patients, of legacy patients. The people I met there taught me um, so much and I went out and researched lots. I became my own doctor. Um, we then, during, during lockdown, um, I got involved with Tiny Cannabis Club, um, who had also met through Milton Keynes, and I'm now very much involved in running, running that organization. Um, and through Tiny Cannabis Club, we've helped our members gain access to legal medication. We've helped them overcome um, stigma in the workplace. We've managed to get legal vape zones provided for um, our members in workplaces. We've had one of our members has just managed to have um, a meme go out to an email go out to, the, to his whole workplace celebrating medical cannabis and it's a brilliant bit of harm reduction and anti-stigma work that has gone out. Um, and now I'm at the point where I feel well. Um, it's amazing. My since switching to legal, it hasn't done what I thought it would do. Having a legal prescription for me has helped me with anxiety. And reducing that anxiety has helped me heal. The product has not. Um, I, I, so, uh, I am still a mix of legal and legacy because the legal product. I must admit, I've now switched clinics and I am now accessing the non-irradiated and it is working. Um, but I still am out of stock again. So it's it's... Very, very, I like being legal, but I don't like the system that we have at all. Okay. So, yeah. And that, that's, that's it, really. Well, I've got one there. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Roth. Um, I'm an accidental cannabis patient. Um, I had never touched black market anything. Um, but I was, at the age of nine, diagnosed with a terminal degenerative condition. Um, and ended up um, in the care system as a result, largely. Um, and from the age of 10 onwards, although I kind of accepted my diagnosis was a death sentence, my, the PTSD I developed from the care system was a life sentence. And every day I was living with flashbacks of what I'd experienced in care. And having tried every medication available, every therapy available, um, and my only knowledge of medical cannabis from, was in my professional role as a lawyer. Um, I thought, you know what, I, I, I've tried everything else. I Googled it, tried it. And my first day on medical cannabis was the first day of my life without a flashback in 21 years. And um, I quit my job the next day um, because I realized that this had the ability to change people's lives like mine. Um, and I've, um, it's now been a few years, two and a half years. Um, I work as a consultant in the industry. I also, um, I also do a lot of legal work related to it. Um, and um, I've never looked back. It's, it's changed my life. It's given me the ability to move on from, um, to bring, an, to bring some sense of closure to what I went through as a kid. And it's made my days livable again. It's given me my life back. Um, and I'm no longer living in the shadow of my diagnoses or in, or in the shadow of what I went through. I'm now able to be me again. And it's a me that I didn't know existed. And now I found cannabis and I found a community and I found um, after going through and being prescribed for my condition, everything from fentanyl to ketamine to, I, to morphine to oxycodone, you name it. Um, and um, it, this has in so many ways given me back control of my own life and my own, and my own destiny. So I'm, I, I do a lot of legal work now trying to make the most of, of, of this fantastic community. Um, and that, yeah, there we go, that's me. Hello everyone, um, my name is Mohamed Bozwe. 
Um, I have consumed cannabis for over 10 years uh, recreationally, and um, it was only last year, uh, August, that I got my prescription. And ever since I got my prescription, I realized that the services and the products were not up to the standards that I was expecting, um, not from the standards that I've experienced internationally. And I thought there needs to be some work done um, from the patient side uh, to get our voices heard and to tell the industry what concerns that we have, which we need resolved now. And so I set up the Sanskara platform. We provide education for the public and patients, providing uh, information about patient rights and um, access to medical cannabis. Uh, we also uh, do consultancy and research for the industry so we can provide uh, the information um, about patient needs to the industry and hopefully get the voices of patients uh, heard by doctors and specialists. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Right. Thank you, Mohammed. I am trying to hold it together at the minute, so I'm in a panic attack. <laughs> Seriously, my hands have gone purple. Are you okay? I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm going to okay? hold it together. Cause like, um, so I'm Jane Ingeliff. Um, I thought I was just a chronic pain patient, but it turns out it's um, actually anxiety. I've got um, functional neurological disorder, but I didn't actually get it diagnosed until about a year ago. And like, my heart's going like the clappers, and my hands just went blue. But um, yeah, Whew, it's the first time speaking in public. But I mean, three years ago, I wouldn't even have my photograph taken, so I'm getting there. But um, yeah, so I mean, I've, I've come from obviously the legacy market. I've used cannabis on and off um, since I was, what, 17? I tried it um, recreationally, but then I was um, in pain since I was 13. So I mean, definitely 18, I was using it for pain. And um, one of my friends gave me some flour because I'd um, crashed my car and hurt my back, and they were like, well, try this. And you know, it worked, and I did use it on and off. Um, and then, you know, I'd been prescribed codeine at the age of 15. At the age of 26, they diagnosed me with fibromyalgia, which was totally incorrect. But because I've got functional neurological disorder, I developed every single symptom of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, everything. Um, so, yeah, I know what it's like to have it. Um, and, I mean, they prescribed me amitriptyline, pregabalin. Um, then, of course, because of the opiates, you need stuff for your stomach. You're, you're on a right cocktail of stuff, stuff to protect your stomach, stuff to keep you... It's, it's an absolute nightmare. And I was using inhalers as well. I've got asthma, which isn't really an issue when I'm on the right amount of cannabis. It's, um, it does work wonders for everything. But yeah, instead of babbling. Um, so yeah, 2018, um, just before it actually all came on prescription, I'd been going on to Twitter. It was after I read um, the report that Mike Barnes actually wrote. Um, I'd um, been going to my doctor asking for more pain relief. I was on a lot of opiates at the time, and, you know, pre gabalin and my triptyline, everything. Um, and all they kept saying to me was, no, no. And then one doctor actually finally explained to me, oh, no, we won't give you any more because you're just in a permanent state of withdrawal. And um, do you know what I mean? It was like, well, why didn't anybody explain that to me before? And none of them did. And when he finally explained that, I'd read this report, and it was like, well... Why have I been left like this for so long? But yeah, and, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, then July 2018, I went to, um, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, so, take, yeah. Take your time, Jane, <laughs> take your time. We're all here for you. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, July 2018, I um, went down to Brighton Green Pride. Now in the June, I'd been blue lighted to hospital because the pain had been that bad and they'd given me morphine and I'd saved some of it because um, I knew that the pain was really bad. I was in a wheelchair at the time, and I went on the, in a wheelchair by myself on the train all the way down to Brighton, took a lot of space cakes with me that I made myself. They weren't very good, because I didn't know what I was doing back then. Didn't decarb the weed first, <laughs> so it wasn't really actually activated. <laughs> um, but um, while I was there, um, I managed to buy some um, space cakes, proper medical-grade ones, and um, I didn't need the oral morphine that I'd been saving, not um, one drop of it. And for the next three days, I didn't need my codeine. Um, so I went to see my doctor, my GP, and I explained to him what I'd been doing with the, with the cakes. So I brought three more home with me. And I explained to him what I'd been doing and told him that I wanted off the patches. At the time, I was on a Brutans patch. 
And I thought, well, the only logical way to come off it is to swap to tablets. And I said to him, well, put me on to codeine or something. And he was like, well, it's not really the right thing to do, and I shouldn't. And, you know, I nagged at him, and he, he sort of gave in in the end. And um, I went home with the codeine and tried to swap using RSO and what have you, and to try to wean myself off it. But um, for some reason, the pain went away with the RSO, came back with the codeine. So I just cold turkeyed it. And then slowly over the last four years, I've come off the rest of the medication, um, apart from the diazepam, which I'm just about off. Um, it's going to be five months, and I'll be totally off all pharmaceuticals. So I'm getting there. Amazing. And, and just as an aside, I think if um, the calculations were done of how much money um, cannabis has saved the NHS with the reduction in all your medications. Uh, I know there's, um, I think, a health economic study that's, I think, fundraising at the moment. I mean, it's really important data that, that needs to be gathered. Um, okay, Mohammed. I mean, you, you set up your, you know, your Sanskara um, um, project because the, the legal market wasn't cutting it. What are the failings that you've noticed? Um, <clears throat> so... Initially, it was the products, because where I was coming from, the legacy market, um, going into the medical cannabis products, it just seemed like it just wasn't reaching that sort of mark where I was getting from the legacy market. And then there was a lot of issues with the different products that were available. So it was only high THC products and low CB, uh, high CBD products. And uh, there was only a few uh, balanced products as well, which just didn't seem right. And then um, there was also issues that I felt was, um, uh, you know, so, uh, was a problem, was that um, there's a lot of products which are irradiated, which I didn't agree with. Um, where I've come from, non-irradiated products to an irradiated product, I could just tell there's just that slight, it's not reaching that um, effect that I need, like the full effect to um, relieve my symptoms. Um, and I saw a lot of, uh, you know, comments on social media, on Facebook, Reddit and everything where uh, patients were saying, well, why, why, why isn't anything being done to raise concerns, um, you know, for, for patients about, um, you know, even the services as well. So where, <clears throat> where patients are having to um, book a follow-up appointment just to change the product strain and all these sorts of things. So people wanted to ask the questions to the industry. And um, there was no platform um, where patients could do that, where they felt they could do that. So I created the Sanskara platform, told patients, you know, you're more than welcome to come volunteer or, you know, support me in um, providing this education for the patients, you know, get this information out, do a bit of research and um, maybe even direct the industry into providing products and services that we really need. Um, there's been kind of talk about the care that's been provided through the clinics it's it's it sounds like it can be a bit patchy um <laughs> okay jeremy over to you <laughs> um don't want to put you on the spot but by the hand that feeds me now but um no it, um the i think what i think what sometimes patients don't really get and what clinics don't really get is that we're existing in a legislative environment that isn't fit for purpose that with, uh, with clinicians who are trying to fit something that is a, fit a square peg in a round hole, and it just doesn't work. These are unlicensed specials, and the, the policies don't work, the systems in place don't work, the fact that we're still relying on FP10 paper prescriptions, because it, 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 there are so many areas where there is room for improvement, and we're still... We, we are so far behind, largely because I think we're hamstrung by a combination of, um, of clinics that are growing too fast for their own good, um, of often rushed product, of, um, but mostly hamstrung by, by, regulatory, by a regulatory system that doesn't understand what it's doing. Bear in mind that the MHRA only took over from the from European Medicines Agency after Brexit, and it's been... Not that it was any better before, but it's been uh, this constant series of cock-ups. And it is, unfortunately, the clinics are, I think, are struggling largely as a result of 
um, this need to pump in new blood, to replace old blood, and this, this sort of Pac-Man effect within the industry where there's a, everyone's, it's going to end up with a divergence of a race to the bottom in terms of price, where it's stack them high, sell them cheap, 50 quid, get them in, get them out, or it's 250 pounds, and you get your full hour, and you get to ask all your questions, and it's, it, it, but we can't exist in a system where you choose between, you have to choose between Ryanair or Emirates. It's that, that there has to be a, an agreed standard of service. There has to be an agreed, between all of the competing commercial interests, there need to be, at the center of that needs to be the patients. And the patients need one thing, and that's consistency. And if one clinic is offering this, another's offering that, and this clinic has this, and this clinic doesn't sell that, and they don't, they send to this pharmacy that won't dispense that, it's doing a disservice to patients. Uh, we deserve better, frankly. And patients can vote with their feet, right? I mean, have, have patients can vote, you can vote with your feet. So have any of you moved um, from one clinic, you don't, please don't name the clinic, probably not good, but um, from yes. one clinic to another because you haven't been satisfied? I have, okay. um, I, I have, um, I, I make no bones about that, but I think the tendency for people to vote with their feet it can be, is only useful when it's done on such a level that, that it actually reaches the people in their pockets, when it reaches the people at the top. If people actually make their voices heard, so the people running, the, the people with the financial interests in the companies are actually hearing, this is why I'm leaving. I'm leaving because you're incompetent, because your admin is terrible, your doctors are great, but your admin is terrible, your doctors are terrible, but your admin is great. That if they don't hear the feedback and we're only doing the British thing of voting with our feet and bitching afterwards, it might, it, it might be really beneficial for us. We might feel like, yeah, we're going to get a prescription from this doctor because they're very good and I've heard this good thing about them. But what's happening about the patients behind you that are still, in the, that, that are still hopping on board that last clinic that doesn't have your feedback or why you left? So, um, yeah. Sorry. That's a really good point. Thank you for making that. Judy, you, you look poised to... Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. I have changed clinics and I have fed back very thoroughly why I changed clinics. And without naming names, for me, it was the irradiation um, situation that the, the medicine was not working for me, the stock issues were there. And there was an arrogance in trying to convey my needs and wishes to, to the clinics. So I switched and I've had much better service. So it was the right thing to do. But yeah, it's very, very important to feed that back. Whether they listen to the feedback or not, I don't know. But I know at the time I left, lots of other patients left at the same time and and from the club members that we we have um, we cover quite a broad quite a number of clinics so I get to see the experiences that other people are having and it isn't one clinic's bad one clinic's good it's like every single one has issues and problems and every single one of us has had really stressful problems and we're all we all have conditions where stress aggravates our illness it's not acceptable at all. What can we do about that? What can be done? Um, I'm with Dr. Kelly. I don't want my flower to be prescribed by a clinic. I, I think we need a herbal medication model for flower. I believe that we need clinicians and we need medically prescribed cannabis um, and that we, we should have the choice in how we access. Um, I also am very, very behind the grow your own belief because you know, I have grown and the satisfaction of producing my own medicine, treating myself with my own medicine, it did far more than anything I've got from any clinic, um, physically, mentally, well-being wise. And that to me, it would ease the pressure on the clinics. I'm not saying that every patient should grow their own because I know that we can't, um, but many of us can, and many of us have got family who want to grow for us. And we should have that right, because what we have is not working. My experiences would be, would be quite different. Um, and so I, I, so I suppose would be my solution. Um, what I think we actually need, from my perspective, is we need a medical cannabis patients union yes. where, that represents the interests of patients solely and can hold commercial interests, can hold commercial interests uh, to account that every other, every other group of people in society are well represented by an organized patient body. But instead, we have something like 25,000 active, actually active medical cannabis patients in the UK. Um, and instead, we have 
two, three subreddits, we have two or three Discord channels and uh, Discord servers, and we have lots of different platforms, but we need to speak with a unified voice, speak the language of legitimacy, to, in a language that people understand, and it's not just the clinicians that need to hear it, it's not just even the commercial interests that need to hear it, it's the policy makers that need to hear it. So, and the, but there is no unified voice, and we need a cannabis patients union. Great idea. I'm quite interested to know, I mean, um, how accepting have friends, family, or your community been of, um, of, of um, your medical cannabis prescription or sort of legacy use, etc.? cetera? Um, so I'm from a British Asian family and um, my family are Muslim. They do not agree with my use of cannabis, but um, ever since I got my cannabis uh, um, uh, prescribed to me, it's kind of lightened the load a little bit. Um, they still kind of have that old school reefer madness um, theory in their heads. Um, they just completely disagree with it. They completely hate the smell. It's understandable. Um, but I've tried my best to educate them and actually tell them the real risks of cannabis as well as the benefits that I'm getting. And um, it's, it's a slow process, but again, they're very conservative with their um, ideology and they're completely against it. And uh, in a way, I don't blame them. But my mother, she suffers from a, an undiagnosed condition which inflames her hand, causes a lot of pain to her hand. And my sister, who's a pharmacist, offered some CBD, but she completely refused it because it's cannabis. So again, yeah, it's been quite difficult to encourage my family that I'm doing the right thing, um, but they've kind of given me the space now, so it's, it's good. Um, so I've kind of had a little bit of a similar background, so my parents are also quite conservative, and, um, but what I would say about my parents was, when I was obviously 13 and growing up as a teenager, they spent hundreds of pounds going to acupuncture, massage, physio, private healthcare, surgeons and operations and, and, and all that. And as soon as I started using cannabis, the, the, the attitude that they, they weren't happy with it, they, 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 they couldn't accept that I had finally found a medication that worked. They were terrified that I was at risk of losing my really good job. I had a piano studio, you know, I had a good standing in the community, I was a church organist, all, all the traditional things you wouldn't associate with, you know, a cannabis smoker, and it terrified them for me to have to access the medication the way I had to access it. When I got my legal script, you know, my, at this point my dad, bless him, he, he stopped telling stories about his friend who smoked weed and then had green goblins chasing off a flat, you know, eventually that did change, but you know, I could see the relief in my parents that I wasn't having to go and go up to a car park at nine o'clock at night and meet a stranger to access this medication. I wasn't putting my siblings at risk of losing their job because they had to go and access medication for me. And if they didn't, they saw the pain and the agony and they were, they were forced to watch that. It, it really did make a big difference having the script, not just to like the attitude, but just for my parents, my family's anxiety, those that cared for me. Anybody else? No? Okay, Julie. I was going to say the same, same thing. My, um, we've got a, dif a difficult situation in that my husband is um, an engineer at Network Rail and he's drugs and alcohol tested. So it's always, <laughs> there's always been a little bit of conflict. So when I uh, went back to cannabis, I'd always kind of had cheeky little joints away from my husband, uh, friends. He, he knew I did, but it was, I'd always keep it away from him. So when I decided, to choose cannabis as my medicine, we had to have some sort of serious conversations because he was really worried about his professional standing and, and everything. Um, having the prescription has eased that for him, but prior to that, he'd accepted, he'd, he had accepted. The change in him is amazing. Um, he was, we've had a few little disputes over the years over it, but he has been very, very supportive. Now he's actually gone and initiated conversations within Network Rail and has managed to get their whole drugs policy changed. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> J 
Jane? Yeah, yeah, I've been sort of quite lucky. My parents are very supportive. Um, I mean, obviously, when I was younger, they never really said anything about the fact that I used to go down the garden and, you know, smoke weed. And I always thought that they didn't know. Um, apparently, they did. But, you know, I mean, you sort of lie to yourself, don't you? They don't know what I'm doing. But, um, yeah, they never really said anything, and they didn't... I don't think they cared as long as I was safe, I suppose. I wasn't out drinking, and I used to do... I did have a problem with alcohol when I was younger. I mean, I worked in a pub, and I was drinking far too much, and the cannabis did save me from that as well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, obviously, now that I've got the prescription, it makes it better for them, because it's, they can be more open about it with their friends and their family, because, you know, I'm all legal, and they don't need to worry so much. And I think that it's easier for my brother as well because he's a bit... I think he's a bit autistic and he doesn't realise it and he thinks I shouldn't be breaking the law. But, you know what I mean, at the end of the day, to me, I'm autistic and it's just a plant and... <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like that we're two totally different spectrums of the autism. But, yeah, I, I see that some people's families have been... But no, I've been really lucky. And they've also been quite supportive of my son that's used cannabis to get um, off his epilepsy drugs. I mean, he was only 18 when he started doing that with the help of his nurse, and he's had a prescription as well. So, yeah, we've been really lucky on that front. Uh. Um, wow. Uh, so, uh, my parents read the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I remember uh, about two years ago, uh, maybe slightly less, I was doing... Um, I was doing some training for a police force. I do that quite often. And I managed to get them to be willing to invite my parents because my parents had never seen the sort of the training that I give, the, the legal perspectives. And there's one message that I always try and drive home, which is every medical cannabis patient is one less customer for a drug dealer. And, and my, my dad, who has, is, is like, very, um, he still reads the Daily Mail, but no one's perfect. Um, and um, like they, they, I think they sort of, they took that away with them. And then six months later, I was getting baked with my mum because she got a medical cannabis prescription for, um, for depression. For as long as I've known her, she's had intractable depression. Um, and although I talk a lot about cannabis giving me my life back, the first time in my life I saw my mum smile and laugh was when she was medicated, when we were both medicated together. It gave me that memory it's like that in 33 years of my life I'd never had. And um, so it had gone from a very sort of conservative family to uh, my mum who has prescribed medical cannabis, me who has prescribed medical cannabis, my dad who, uh, who, thinks, he's, who thinks he's surrounded by stoners, because um, <laughs> he is. Um, and um, yeah, although interestingly enough, my dad used to introduce me to the rabbi as, this is my son, the lawyer, and it's now, this is my son, the drug dealer. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, Anyway, uh, but there we go. So, they're, they're, yeah, they're okay with it. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> okay, so talking about um, medicating, obviously it's been a bit of a journey for, for many people here in terms of what the original policy was in the venue for medicating. Um, and we got there. We got there in the end. And, you know, there has been the space that's been made available outside, and it was a bit dicey, but it happened. So... Um, <laughs> But I wanted to know, um, just generally, how comfortable do you feel medicating in public? How does it work? Um, to be honest, I've always been comfortable medicating out in public, even before my prescription. Um, I'm not going to lie, I've been smoking joints outside the Buckingham Palace, um, outside the Parliament. I've done it everywhere. Um, but... I've had some experiences in life which kind of give me a bit of trauma with the police and things, so um, it had held me back. But ever since I got my prescription, it's sort of given me that confidence back to just consume it outside. Obviously, we still have a bit of an issue depending on what venues you go to, uh, but there's been some great support from a lot of uh, venues, great uh, companies as well, which are allowing patients to take medical cannabis with them. And um, yeah, I just. I feel comfortable. Even this morning on the train here, I was just preparing my dose because I was uh, in a bit of a rush, and no one really batted an eye, so it was, it was pretty easy. Great. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I've medicated quite a bit in public. I mean, I always did used to, um, even before prescriptions, I'd 
you know, stand up or stop and smoke a joint and what have you been before I've vaped. But, um, I mean, I've gone in the local pub and I've vaped and, I mean, I've took my volcano outside a pub and even inside. We had gone to the seaside and coming back, I'd been using my mighty and it just wasn't cutting it. And I went in and I said to the lady behind the bar, is it okay if I use my medical vaporizer? And I didn't say anything else. And she's like, yeah, you can just go use the back room. And I went through and I used my volcano. They didn't say a word. So I don't know if they were expecting it or what, but, yeah, I've had no issues with it and... Most places have been all right, so we'll find out what the next place is like when I take my volcano in today, won't we? <laughs> um, and I've had some quite bizarre experiences. Um, I, I have to stay in hotels quite often for work, and um, I am invariably vaping outside. Um, I won't vape inside, um, but I'll vape outside. And... The difficulty I have, I have so many times been challenged by police, and I actually kind of relish that. I really look forward to it because I'm a yeah because I'm a because I'm a dick at heart, and um, and I so when I'm vaping outside a posh hotel in London, I can talk the talk. I'm a lawyer. I know what I'm doing. But the amount of police officers when I said actually it's prescribed, and the response is no, it's not. I said well actually actually it's been legal since 20. No, it's not. And I said okay and I always carry a copy of the legislation with me because I'm a lawyer. And, and the look on their face when they're like, uh, I've had officers that I've been serving for 40 years, no one's ever trained me on this. I said, okay, so who's, who's your training officer? Who's in charge of drugs and alcohol policy? And I'm, on, and I'm on the email to them that evening saying, well, this has just happened. And it's either, you know, do you want to be sued for discrimination? Or, I mean, this is the... And that, but my problem is more that this is me speaking as a... Uh, speaking as an educated person outside a posh hotel in London, but what if I was, um, what if I was from a different ethnicity in Newham? I, I, the, I, I think there is a distinct difference between someone like me who can talk the talk, who can educate the police, and who they'll, they'll actually listen to, than someone who might not have the luxuries that I have and might not be of, of the lucidity and be able to just whip out the, here's the legislation, actually, because not everyone's a dick like me. And it's, it, it might be, um, for me, I, I look forward to those instances where I get the, the opportunity to prove them wrong because I think it's important and every time is an education. But, um, but there's still a very, very long way. I wasn't putting myself down. I'm proud of being a dick. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, 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 a, I'm a lawyer. It's second nature. So, so yeah, I'm very confident in consuming publicly. I have been pre-legalisation, um, and um, one of the things again that we do as a club is encourage other members to. To, to advocate for themselves to be able to consume where they need to consume because we do. You know, I, we've, there's been a lot of talk today about things, oil versus flour. Oil doesn't suit me. I can't tolerate it. It, it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not um, effective medicine for me, so I'm stuck with flour. You know, I love my flour, but it doesn't last as long necessarily, so I do need to have places where I can medicate, and I, I go and do that wherever I need to. But one of the first problems I had was, um, it was actually a reggae festival, and I had always smuggled my weed into venues with me, and I didn't want to do that anymore. I've got a prescription. I'm paying for the privilege of being able to consume my medication when I need to. So I contacted them to take my medication in and was told no illegal drugs allowed. I said, well, I'm sorry. This is a prescription. Um, it's a legal medication. Um, if it was codeine, you know, could I bring that? Oh, yes, you can bring codeine, but you can't bring cannabis because we don't allow... So. Again, it was to and fro. They weren't going to back down. Um, in the end, I actually got Thames Valley Police on my side. <laughs> so I ended up being escorted into the reggae festival by Babylon, which was... Um, escorted into a festival by into, the police. Into a festival that, by the that, police with my new. prescription. Um, yeah, they backed down. <laughs> but I think everybody needs... We, need, we all need to, if we're confident enough and we have that privilege of a prescription, I personally believe it is my duty to to destigmatize by consuming publicly um, because and, and educating people because I'm confident in doing that. So
So on that note, um, both, um, well, sort of directing this to Jeremy and, and Mohammed, um, I'd like you to just describe the work you've been doing in your own time in different aspects in, in relation to what is happening with the police, um, the lack of a joined up approach, um, the various kind of instances that have been going on. So Mohammed, over to you. Okay, so the first month I got my prescription, um, I got arrested, my medication was taken, and the officer completely refused to give my medication back. He said, it's cannabis, it's cannabis, it's cannabis, and then give it back. Um, so, again, I was thinking, well, what is the uh, verification method? Because if it was a, a normal medication, it would have my prescription label on it, with my name on it, with all the details I need and they'd be able to check my ID, give me back my medication. Um, so I contacted the Department of Health and Social Care and actually made an inquiry, asked them what is the method of verifying a legitimate prescription because there doesn't seem to be any information anywhere published by any department um, about a, legal, a method of verifying a legal prescription. And they responded back and they responded back pretty well and said, you know, prescription legal is actually just enough uh, with, a, with an ID or if necessary a copy of your um, clinical letter or a copy of your FP10 prescription and um, hopefully I'm using that letter to you know inform patients and inform the police forces about uh, prescriptions and how to verify a medical cannabis prescription sorry um, and, and rather than you know uh, doctor, uh, sorry, the police uh, saying, oh yeah, no, there is no such thing as a uh, cannabis prescription or um, we have to check this way and that way, you know, or you need a cannabis card of this sort and it's like, it, it, we, we do need to make some clarity and hopefully this letter that I've got will, will, will do that because I've published it on the website, on, on social media and everything. Everyone can access it, download it for themselves, so if anyone has any issues with the police, just show them that letter and that's how you want to get verified and that's it, just walk away. Great job. Um, so I got, um, I, I'm not going to say I got rather dickish, but um, I, uh, when I heard that there were people that were getting arrested for their legitimate medical cannabis prescriptions, I did freedom of information requests to 85 different police forces in the UK, all of them, to get their policy on the verification of medical cannabis prescriptions. Um, I also got, um, I also got uh, the formal policy from the Home Office. The response was, we don't have a policy. I got, their, they, I got their position statement and found that their position statement was at odds with almost every one of the police forces, and almost every one of the police forces was different to each other, which means that if you are driving along a motorway, one part of the motorway, if you're stopped by the police, you'll be expected to produce something in evidence because that's their local policy. And the next police force, the other side, of the, a little bit further along, could have a completely different set of standards. So I commenced the pre-action for the largest judicial review uh, in English and Welsh history on medical cannabis um, against the against Secretary of State for Justice to try and get uh, to try and force them to impose a. Uh, one unified approach to the verification of medical cannabis prescriptions because there is no unified policy. There's been a white paper since 2018, but there's been no policy. The Department of Health and Social Care have one, but the Department of Health and Social Care don't run the police, the Home Office do. So they don't talk to each other. So one has a policy, the other one doesn't. The other one has a position statement but doesn't tell the police. Um, and the people responsible are the Secretary of State for Justice and the Home Office the people suffering are the patients, but it's in no one's interest, the taxpayer, the, the police, the patients, the public, for police time to be used up discriminating against legitimate patients. So I'm starting uh, the largest judicial review um, in English and Welsh history taking uh, uh, in, on this subject, um, trying to force them to impose a national, a national standard. And so far the response has been uh, pretty damn good. So um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I, I'm, I'm in awe of all of you. I really and truly am. Um, I hope that doesn't sound patronizing, but it's just like, I just absolutely am. Thank you so much for everything that you're bringing to, to this panel and to, to everything that you're moving the, the, 
the, the fight forward. Um, I had loads more questions, but this kind of weird time zone thing when everything kind of moves quicker than it does everywhere else is happening again. So we're going to go straight to the questions from the audience. Hi, um, I've just come in late into the conference today, but... It's fine, so did I. <laughs> my, my question was, I'm asking this from a Sanskrit perspective, the language of Sanskrit of India. When I see this word drug, and I look at the word for drug in Sanskrit, there is no word for drug in Sanskrit. We have a word for medicine, we have a word for food. So my first question was, do we need to change the narrative of this word drug, which it isn't. The reason I say that, one of my friends told me, yeah, but it's got psychoactive properties. So I says, all right, so I looked up other psychoactive containing properties. Turmeric has psychoactive properties to help Alzheimer's. So do we need to change the narrative? Because the word drug is so derogatory, just like marijuana is derogatory to other people. Do we need to change that narrative, bring that the word cannabis, and also with that, how do we bring in the scope of this Indian medicine from which this plant is rooted and saying where are the Ayurvedic practitioners which cannabis formed a major part of is not good enough to just say Om Namo Shivaya and then that's it and then you've got your cannabis. This is rooted in their culture and how do we then ultimately connect to people in India, the Ayurvedic practitioners say this is your rootage right? It's been displaced for 80 years since 1930s. How do we bring it back into the fold and actually say, well, maybe we're missing a huge part of research, which is from Indian history, but they not looked at it because British colonialism, which has scared them to death. Thank you. Who is that? To, who would you... I, I was going to say, yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm totally on board with that, because, I mean, I always go on about the fact that cannabis is actually technically a vegetable, because you can use every single part of it including the root and so I read somewhere that if you can use every single part of the plant then technically it's actually a vegetable so I don't know I don't really class it as a drug um, I don't think it really is and a lot of people say well when you use cannabis every day does that mean you're addicted to it and I'm like well I use water every day I'm addicted to water as well it's where do you draw the line it's you know there is a a bit of a we do need to maybe recategorize it a little bit because it isn't really a drug it's a plant I, I, I always talk about oh, sorry just one else to, uh, I, yep. so I think that you brought up a really really interesting point and this might be a little bit controversial but I think part of moving away from this idea of drug is if we also as well as patients stop referring to it as medical cannabis and we just refer to it as cannabis because all cannabis is medicinal. And I think when we, even ourselves as patients, make the difference of, well, I'm on medical cannabis, we are othering other users who use it recreationally, who might be using it medicinally and not realise it because of all the connotations we've got around the drug. Um, I would... I would politely disagree because I think that that's probably, I, I'd say we're probably about 20 years too soon for that. And I think that we need to start speaking the language of legit legitimacy first. That this is a, I think eventually we get to the part where the step after legalization and normalization is when we can, when we're not talking about it as a drug anymore, we've got to first talk about legitimacy. We've got to legitimize it first before we can regulate it, before we can get it into normal, into normal conversational parameters as another medicine. That this is treating a this is treating a legitimate problem, and I think talking about it as medical cannabis does distinguish it from recreational cannabis. But I think that's important for the public narrative. I think that the public narrative around cannabis in the zeitgeist in the UK is always that cannabis is a is a is a gateway drug, and and it's uh, but we've normalised alcohol, we've normalised people fighting on the streets because they're drunk. I've never known anyone that's medicated to do anything except to eat pizza. It's just, that, but, so it's about talking the language of legitimacy. It's about understanding that the use of the word drug carries a he very heavy weight, but the use of the word medicine is curative. And, and it's about, I, so I want to get to the place where you're talking, where you're talking about, I just think we're probably a bit too soon for that. A bit premature. I'm not sure if anyone can touch on the Ayurvedic um, element to it, but um, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, okay. 
Hi. Sorry, <laughs> not used to speaking on this, but I wondered if any of you have travelled with your medicine. Um, if you have, can you kind of describe your experience? And if not, how do you cope with going without your medicine? I feel like I'm talking far too much, and I probably am. Um, when they invited me on the panel, I said, the problem isn't getting me to talk, it's getting me to shut up. And um, I travel a lot, and I travel a lot with my medication. Um, and the, um, I've had a range of different experiences. I think what we've, what's important to convey is that what happens in the UK when you leave and when you arrive back doesn't guarantee what's going to happen at the other end. So if, so for example, I travelled to lots of countries in, in Europe. I've been to North Macedonia, I've been to Port Poland, I've been to Portugal, I've been all over the, Romania with my medication, and attitudes differ hugely. Um, but it, with preparation, contacting the embassy is sometimes really important, even just a letter to confirm that any UK prescribed medication will be respected by, and then if you get something from their embassy, that often helps. I tend to try and notify the airport in advance that I'll be bringing this medication with me, because otherwise if there's a drugs dog there that indicates, then, and they don't stop me, then it looks like on camera. So anyway, I try to do that, but often now it's got to a point where I make sure I'm armed to the, I'm not going to say armed to the teeth, that's a bad context to use when I'm about to board a plane, but I'm, um, I, I have all the evidence I need to be able to demonstrate the legitimacy of my medication. Often you're dealing with airport security staff who are agency staff who don't really know what they're doing, but asking for the supervisor before I even go through the scanner is often quite helpful. Um, but yeah, and dealing with the attitudes at the other end, preparation. It's all about preparation, for me at least. And um, basically, the uh, you said you're a lawyer, okay? So Guilty. there's a there's a huge community within the common law court who are medical cannabis users. Can you join forces with them? Because that would be a really amazing thing from my perspective. That would be an amazing thing if you could do that. What, what do you mean, the common law court? There is a commonlawcourt.com. There's a common law court of um, international. But if you, there is basically a, a massive community of people that have gone from over to common law to the common law court and registered with common law, and there's a huge medical cannabis community there. So uh, all you need to do is just go to commonlawcourt.com and get in touch with them and just say what you do. And I feel that everybody who is registered with them, which is thousands and thousands of people, would really benefit from what you're doing because there seems to be this disconnect between you as a lawyer and what they're doing. But it's exactly the same thing. It's advocating for the same thing. Um, I would be... Thank you, by the way. I've never heard of the organisation, um, but I am, in general, really apprehensive about where, with the organisations with which I associate my name because... I want to be a cannabis patient, not the cannabis patient. I want to be a lawyer, not the lawyer. I'm doing a judicial review, not... F I, yes, I am a patient, but I don't live in all 80-something areas that, the police are at, that I have the police forces policies for. So when it comes down to it, I'd much rather work with patients, do it by patients, for patients, getting other solicitors that might not be experts in, in medical cannabis but understand discrimination law or public law um, or, the, um, or, the, or the, sorry, the, PISA, the Public Sector Equality Duty and the Equalities Act. Um, to, I'm doing a judicial review against the DVLA as well. That's a whole other thing. But um, uh, again, I could talk for ages. But um, it's... So I, I have some barristers I work really closely with and a lot of them are very, very passionate about this too because they also see the complete failure of the regulatory environment to, meet, to keep up with the, to the changing times. We live, so I, I completely get what, where you're going, that there needs to be more joined up writing in the legal community. It's just I think that that has to start somewhere and that's grassroots. And um, yeah, so I, I've never heard of the organisation. I'll look into it. But. I'll check it out. Talk after. 
And I, I, one question I really want to ask, which I think maybe people could jump on Jeremy in not like literally, jump on, but could jump on Jeremy. No, but just I was, you know, I was interested. What, what is the legal recourse for discrimination? We've got to go to Zoom, um, but maybe um, sure. okay. just quickly. Sorry. So um, if you are, if you feel that, so re, I'll, I'll give a really brief summary. I, I do lectures, so I'll try and keep it really short. Um, so discrimination is against a protected characteristic. One of those is disability under the Equalities Act. It used to be discrim Dis Disability Discrimination Act. But also we have something really useful in the UK called the Public Sector Equality Duty, or PSED. That means that public sector agencies and organisations don't just have a right to stop discrimination when it happens, but to take proactive steps to prevent it happening. So if they have failed to prevent discrimination when it's foreseeable, they failed under the public sector equality duty. So if, if someone experiences discrimination from a government, from a government body, the police, um, a, a, the Department of Health, Department of Education, then um, often the formal complaints procedure is a bit of a joke, but you need to exhaust it before you take it further. Contact a, contact a, a, dis, a discrimination solicitor that specializes in it. There are lots of them. Um, and um, and take it from there, but don't be afraid to to approach a to approach a solicitor and go at it because the more people that, that raise it through the courts, the more likelihood we have of actually changing the policy because they're going to get so sick of us. Um, if it happens privately, then private. Uh, it, I mean, every place has a has a policy on entry that says that. Um, that they ultimately have sole discretion, and if they say no cannabis, then you do have the right to be with your medication, but you don't necessarily have the right to use your medication in a place of your choosing. Uh, there, is, there, are diff there is a variation in case law there, um, but if you feel discriminated against, I'm, I'm gonna be the typical lawyer, lawyer and just say, lawyer up. There are loads of solicitors that will act for you for nothing because they will uh, because at the end the, because the pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow for them as well. So your interests are aligned, um, but don't don't be afraid to get legal advice. Really, there is a lot out there. There are some fantastic firms. Um, I, I I'm not one of them, but um, it's, uh, yeah. So don't be afraid to, to to lawyer up. Is what I'd say, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go to Zoom now. I think. Okay, and just a quick update on the poll. 52% um, of, of uh, our uh, Zoom chat said that cannabis successfully manages their symptoms. 43 said it somewhat manages their symptoms. And 4% said it makes no difference at all. So that's rather surprising. Um, the first question to the panel is not really a question at all, uh, but it's merely a statement from quite a few people in the audience to say, Jane, we love you, and there is a fan club on the Zoom chat. So, big up to yourself. Go, Jane. Go, Jane. Okay. Um, the, uh, so, one question is uh, essentially from a patient. Um, uh, who can I get advice on which medication could help me? I have been prescribed an oil from a clinic, but I have no way of knowing whether this oil is the optimal oil for me. And I think this is shared by a lot of people in chat who are unsure of the veracity of the advice that they're getting. Yeah, no, this is the thing. Um, I've been getting the same sort of questions uh, through the Sanskara platform. Um, it is a very personal experience and unfortunately also the specialists that prescribe the cannabis have to give you this advice too. So depending on your condition, depending on your body, uh, your the chemical structure in your body and all of that um, accounts for it, so it's just trial and error, unfortunately. And it's sad that we don't get, you know, tasters for our products. But yeah, it's um, it's just trial and error, unfortunately. Um, I've got one more question for myself, if that's okay. If that's okay. Well, it's a it's a quick question. So, Jeremy, um, you spoke uh, briefly on the uh, language uh, that we, as a community, need to use the language of legitimacy. But one of the the issues that we have as a cannabis community is that the majority of us are uh, ourselves uh, very sick, treating people who are very sick themselves uh, who are traumatized. And we're not able sometimes to address even ourselves, even when we're trying to calm ourselves down with rationality. Uh, like how, what do you, like, and this is as well for the, the rest of the panel, what do you feel that we need to do in order to, you know, what, but what, what do we need to do to transition our community? I don't know if that's the right word to, to that legitimacy. I, thanks for the question, by the way. Um, I think that there's 
when, I, when I'm teaching undergrads, for example, about how to argue a case, we talk about, uh, my phrase to them is, is this the hill I want to die on? In other words, pick your battles. That if you're going to argue with someone about cannabis, is this someone who, is, who, is, who has a view that's so baked in in irrationality that you're never going to change their mind? Why bother? Don't waste your breath. Um, pick your battles. Um, but also, it's about simmering it down to people that, that have only ever understood cannabis to be one thing and that's a gateway drug, or that's, or that's the, the, the worst thing in society that's going to end up with all of us injecting heroin into our eyeballs. Uh, the, the, it's about, it, like, the, the phraseology that I, that I intentionally employ, like every medical cannabis patient is one less customer for a drug dealer, to a police officer, that's, that, that's catnip. Because it, it's, and, and it's about packaging it in a really simple phrase that people can actually get behind, that they understand that this is not just uh, this isn't a drug. This is a medicine. This isn't a, this isn't a public health issue. That this, sorry, this isn't a this isn't a public order issue. It's a public health issue, and um, that we've all been traumatized. But the system that we ex were expected to operate in is traumatizing us. This this constant need to prove ourselves that in a way that no other patients have to is traumatizing in itself. And. Um, <laughs> But I, I just want to finish by saying one thing, that there will be people, we, I might not be alive to see it, I probably won't, but there will be people that come after us that will be better off, that will be, that will be able to medicate, and that will be able to do so in peace because of what we went through today, because of what we've done the past four years, and what we'll do the next few years, and the, the pain and all the challenging by the police. One day, our kids will not have to go through this shit. Well, I think that's a really powerful note to end on. Thank you all. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It's been very rich and, and um, enlightening. Thank you.